Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Before we begin tonight, I would like us to take a moment of silence for Corinne Wood, who passed away recently. Thank you. Our curator's report tonight is by Christine Gustafson. Thank you, Christine. Hi, I'm Chris Gustafson, Vice President. Curator Linda Davis reported that we had a request for information regarding Luther Goddard. Photographs of our Luther Goddard watches were submitted for display at a national watch collectors group meeting. Patton School third graders will visit the museum tomorrow and Spring Street students will visit on June 7th. Two Shrewsbury Historical Society scholarships were presented at the Shrewsbury High School Awards Night. Details about these and other programs are included in the annual report that was mailed to members. Okay, thank you. Can we have our Treasury's report by Jeffrey Undercoffler? Yes, hi, thank you, Erica. My name is Jeffrey Undercoffler, I'm the Treasurer's Society. And I just wanted to report that you know, our bills are uh, paid and our accounts are up to date. The biggest thing we had done recently was we had our railings on the south side of the building at the 1830 schoolhouse uh, refurbished to bring it up to, to the appropriate building code. So that was the latest thing that we did. And I just wanted to have everyone look uh, out for their uh, membership renewal applications that should be coming up out to you in the upcoming uh, newsletters as well. Um, thank you, Eric. Okay, thank you. Uh, our presentation tonight is Royal Barry Wills, Champion of Cape Cod Style Architecture by Lorna Condon. Uh, something about the program, Royal Barry Wills was profiled in a 1946 Life Magazine article entitled, Royal Barry Wills, Boston Architect Designs the Kind of Houses Most Americans Want. The piece went on to describe him as the nation's most popular architectural author and the leading US designer of small traditional houses. In this illustrated talk, Lorna Condon, senior curator of the Library and Archives at Historic New England, will discuss Will's influence on the American domestic architecture, particularly though his emphasis on Cape Cod style houses. Using materials in the Royal Barry Wills and Associates archives at Historic New England, Lorna will highlight Wills numerous publications, brilliant marketing skills and design talent. About the presenter, as a senior curator of the library and archives at Historic New England, Laura Condon has had the opportunity to work with and expand the organization's significant collections of photographs, books, architectural drawings, manuscripts, and ephemera. In order to share these collections with the public and to raise awareness of them, she has published articles, curated exhibitions, lectured frequently. Lorna all currently serves on the boards of the Ephemera Society of America, the Tickner Society and the Amesbury Carriage Museum and on the Massachusetts Historical Society's Collections Committee. Lorna. Great. Thank you very much, Eric, for that nice introduction. Uh, and thank you all for inviting me to speak uh, with you tonight about Royal Barry Wills and the Royal Barry Wills Associates Archives at Historic New England. I want to send out a special thanks to Chris Gustafson and to Krista Fogg for their help with this presentation. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to just want to introduce you or update you about Historic New England, uh, my organization, um, which I think we have many similarities with yours. Uh, as, so as many of you may know, Historic New England is the oldest and largest regional heritage organization in the United States. We have 38 historic sites throughout New England. I'm showing you just a few in the next couple of slides. And I am very happy to report that all of them will be open this summer for the first time in two years. And our opening day is June 4th. So I invite you all to come and see some of the sites um, of which, I, as I said, I'm just showing you a few. Um, we also, Historic New England also owns uh, uh, and operate rates. Um, I'm sorry. I also want to say that we are the stewards 
to 123,000 architects that illustrate domestic life in New England, whether at our sites, such as this uh, room uh, at the Codman House in Lincoln, Massachusetts, or at our collections facility in Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is open to visitors through tours or appointments. The Library and Archives, of which I curate the collections, uh, is located at the Otis House in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, we uh, have 1.5 million archival documents, which include an extraordinary and one of the largest collections of regional documentary photography in the United States. We are very uh, pleased to have the Hiram Harlow collection uh, in, in our archives. And it is, um, and thanks to that, we have numerous images of Shrewsbury, uh, Westboro, and Northboro in the 19th and early 20th century. And I'm just showing you uh, a, a few of the, Hi the um, Hiram Harlow collection. Um, the one on the bottom is not from the Harlow collection. That is from the uh, Mary Harrod North End collection of the Iris Garden and Pergola at Iris Thought Farm. Um, Let's see. We also have, Historic New England has, uh, in addition to, uh, we have a, a thousands of art, the thousands of artifacts and archival documents are available to the public via our website. You can also uh, access the houses through virtual tours on our website. And uh, other Historic New England programs include our award-winning school programs, uh, programs both for adults, for adults both in person and online, and our exhibitions, which take place at the Eustace Estate in Milton, Massachusetts. And I'm happy to tell you about our forthcoming exhibition, which opens on uh, June 10th, which is called Loud, Naked, and in Three Colors, The History of Tattooing in Boston. And it's th through a stunning selection of flash art, photography, and objects, loud, naked, and in three colors, explores tattooing in Boston from the late 19th century through the mid uh, 20th century when tattooing was outlawed by the state of Massachusetts um, as a health hazard. hazard. And finally, I want to mention our preservation easement program, which provides legal protection for historic houses and landscapes. Currently, Historic New England holds um, more than 115 properties are part of the easement program. They reflect a range of architectural styles, demographics, time periods, and rural suburb, and they are in rural, suburban, and urban areas. And I want to compliment you on your annual Shrewsbury Historical Society Restoration and Preservation Award, which Chris let me know about. Uh, I think it's a wonderful effort and what, how fortunate we are to have such two uh, wonderful programs to help us protect our, our, our historic sites and resources. So now it's my great pleasure to talk to you about uh, Royal Barry Wills. And as you mentioned, Eric, um, Royal Barry Wills, Life Magazine published an article in 1946 entitled Royal Barry Wills, Boston Architect Designs the Kinds of Houses Most Americans Want. It described Wills as, quote, the nation's most popular architectural author and, quote, the leading U.S. designer of small traditional houses. Wills was again the focus of a long article in a major magazine in 1958, when the Saturday Evening Post published Big Man in Small Houses. It noted that Royal Barry Wills was one of the highest paid architects in America, but he is also the designer of a home you can build for $5,000. When Wills died in 1962, his colleague, architect Leon Keach wrote, quote, Many of us think that no other American architect has equaled wills in influencing the average person toward an awareness of good house design. Indeed, his was the only architect's name most of them would ever know. Keach was absolutely correct. During his lifetime, Royal Barry Wills was indeed a household name. 
As we move on, I just want to mention that nearly all of the images that you will see tonight, photographs, architectural drawings, sketches, manuscripts, correspondence, ephemera, are from the Royal Associates Archives at Historic New England, which we received as a gift from Royal son Richard in 1913, and of which you'll hear more about later. So Royal Barry Wills was born in Melrose, Massachusetts on August 21st, 1895. Upon graduation from Melrose High School in 1914, he entered the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he studied architectural engineering. Graduating in 1918 in the midst of World War I, Wills enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserve and took a, a training course at MIT in naval architecture, which led to a position in the de design department of the William Cramp and Sons Ship and Engine Building Company in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Returning to Boston in 1919, Wills received a letter of recommendation. And I'm showing you a number of court, uh, letters, both from the Boston Navy Yard and from uh, MIT and from Turner Construction. These are all part of the w Royal Barry Wills archives. Um, so the letter was from William H. Lawrence, professor of architectural engineering and chairman of the department at MIT. Lawrence noted, quote, I have known Mr. Wills intimately since his entrance into the Institute and had him directly under me, under my charge. I found him an earnest, reliable young man of excellent ability and character. Shortly after uh, receiving the recommendation from Lawrence, Wills was hired as a draftsman by the Turner Construction Company in Boston at a salary of $100 a month. Writing later, Wills would expand this staid biography, and I quote, in my formative years, I worked as a bellhop, a surveyor, a carpenter's helper, a chipper, a caulker, a ship designer, a mason's helper, a cartoonist, and a necktie salesman. salesman. So remember the, uh, that he was a cartoonist. You'll hear more about that as we go along. At Turner Construction, Wills worked on, in his words, quote, large concrete structures, close quote. But his real interest lay in residential architecture. He wanted to provide well-designed, well-constructed, affordable suburban houses for middle and upper middle um, income Americans. He developed a plan to promote himself by contracting with Boston newspapers to provide building plans for a variety of houses styles that would be offered for sale by the newspapers. And I'm just going to show you a few. Here is one for a, a half timbered um, a house, a, a half timbered English cottage, uh, which is from 1929. Here is another half timbered cottage, which he would provide the, the illustration, the floor plan. And contrary to what you might think about Wills, um, oh, here's a French, a house in the French manor style. And contrary to what you might think, he did design buildings in the modern style as such as this such as this one and of course he he never forgot the cape cod style uh, so this was also a home building plan that he offered for sale readers were encouraged to contact wills through the papers with questions that they might have about the buildings and these clippings that i've just shown you are, from, are all taken from the more than 18 scrapbooks that the firm kept from 1927 to 1972, an amazing resource. The exposure 
brought clients to Wills, and he was able to learn, leave Turner Construction in 1925 um, and open his own firm at 8 Beacon Street in Boston, the year he became a registered architect. For those clients, Wills began to design houses in a variety of styles, as you have seen from the newspaper clippings, but gradually his focus turned to the Cape Cod style home, as it did for his own house in Melrose, Massachusetts. Uh, Wells and Marguerite Waggett had married in 1920, and he built this house for his growing family in 1929. And you can see that it's, a, it's a certainly an idealized painting. Uh, it is done by a Wills family member, but it speaks to all of uh, the traditional Cape Cod features that Wills would go on to expound. The focus on the Cape Cod style house cemented Wills's reputation. The public responded enthusiastically to Wills's ability to meld traditional design with modern technology and his attention to detail, carefully, very carefully studied proportions, narrow clapboards, slender muttons in the windows, massive corbel chimneys, bow windows, and more. And all of these things that I've just mentioned, except for the bow window, you can see in, this, in his own house. For Wills, it was important that the quote, the house should be bent to fit the family and not the family to the house. During the 1930s, Wills began to attract national attention. He received a gold medal from President Herbert Hoover for his winning entry in the 1932 Better Homes in America Small House Competition. And you can see um, the president handing Wills the medal. I'm sorry to say that the medal is not in our collection. The medal was stolen many years ago from Royal Barry Wills. It is a very strange story. And the person who sold it, stole it, went on to impersonate Royal Barry Wills across the country even marrying a woman under Royal Barry Wills's name. And Royal Barry Wills had to place ads in newspapers across the country saying, this person is an imposter. So it's a very strange story, um, but I thought it would be of an inter interest in if you were wondering what happened to the medal. Um, so he would go on, uh, here, is, here is the president handing him the award. Here is the house, uh, the winning house, which is located in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, Wills would go on to win medals and honorable mention in House Beautiful and Better Homes and Garden competitions, among others, for several years. And here is an article about the Better Homes in America small house architectural uh, competition from the architectural record. And again, it's from the scrapbook. In 1938, Life Magazine and Architectural Forum invited eight well-known architects, American architects, to participate in a competition to design homes for specific families in four income categories. In the category for people with incomes of $5,000 to $6,000, Royal Barry Wills was pitted against another three name architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. The black born family of Adena, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis, eventually selected the Royal Barry Wills design for their house and not the Frank Lloyd Wright house. As Wills became more successful, he hired other architects and draftsmen to assist him including Hugh A. Stubbins, Nathaniel Perry Tufts, and Amelia Brooks Belt. Um, Hugh Stubbins would go on to become a modern architect of significant note. His designs include the City Corps uh, Center in New York City, the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston, and the Congress Hall in Berlin. For Wills, 
he concentrated on designs of the modern in the modern style. So Wills's success was much the result was as much the result of his business acumen as it was his aptitude for design. Writing in the business of architecture, first published in 1941, which he illustrated his own cartoons. Remember, we I had mentioned that he had said he was a cartoonist. He noted that the architect must be both a professional and a businessman. Quote, there is no other way to succeed amidst competition from within and without the profession. And here is a cartoon um, of one way to get attention, blow your own horn. In the book, Wills and collaborator Leon Keach offered advice about setting up a business and about how to promote oneself and attract clients. And here is um, stalking and the stalking and the capture of the client. So the way they suggested that what they do, you do this is you enter architectural competitions, you give illustrated lectures, you speak on the radio, you write regular newspaper and architectural columns, all of which, all of these things and more, Wills did with consummate skill to promote himself and his work. He mentioned, he wrote eight books, seven in addition to the business of architecture. Uh, um, he, so, he, he, so, he wrote eight books offering advice about architecture of which hundreds of thousands of copies sold. He hosted a radio program. He lectured widely. He received numerous awards and he was the subject of or author of hundreds of magazine articles. So given the influence of Wills's house plan catalogs, which can be seen in the number of copies sold, I want to say just a few words about a couple of the books that Wills wrote. Houses for Good Living, Wills first effort was published in 1941. In the foreword, Wills writes, quote, no matter where you go in this broad, land of ours, well-designed houses are rare. This book, Houses for Good Living, attempts to break the continuity of mediocre house design by giving you essential facts concerning the true possibilities of the small house through photographic illustration and by means of analyses that can help to marshal your thoughts and group them in a clear picture of your family's needs and what you have a right to expect in the house that you build. And here is a chart, a living chart from uh, houses, um, for good, for houses for Good Living in which he talks about cooking, eating, sleeping, relaxing, child playing, um, laundering, bathing, hobbying, entertaining, working, and so on. Throughout five chapters with numerous illustrations, Wills advises potential homeowners to carefully analyze their needs, consider styles, consider the budget, and think about ways to save money. And of course, consider the value of hiring an architect. In Houses for Homemakers, published in 1945, Wills states, quote, during World War II, some 1,500,000 of our countrymen expressed themselves as ready and eager to build a small house as soon as conditions permitted. Most of them were renters who saw the social and economic stability that home ownership would bring. So, and then Wills goes on to write, this book should be of value to the 1,500,000 and their descendants. Like Houses for Homemakers, it advocates for clear and thoughtful planning and then illustrates 
and then illustrates uh, the, the, with numerous drawings, houses of different styles and elevations and floor plans grouped from, uh, by cost from $2,500 to more than $12,000. And I just wanna share with you again, some more of his humorous cartoons. And in this uh, page, you're looking at, uh, Wills is talking about the preparation of food, polite whoopee, the second one down, lovemaking, laundering, bathing, uh, partying, relaxing, child play, bill paying, and sleeping. So you can see that Wills has a tremendous sense of humor um, in his writing and in his illustration as well. The late David Gephardt, who was professor of art history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, wrote an essay about Wills uh, it was really one of the first um, long essays that uh, it, that uh, studied Wills's work and his influence, and it was published in 1990. And Gephardt writes um, that he notes there are several possible reasons for Wills's professional and popular success. Uh, colon, his adroit marketing of himself and his products, of which we have talked about his talent as a designer, and his sensitive understanding of and reaction to the tenor and mood of the times. Gephardt went on to state that Wills's self-assigned task was to transform the 18th century colonial image into a potent object that could stand for middle-class Americans. Like most traditionalists, Gephardt writes, Wills used the images and details of historic precedent to produce idealized versions of buildings of the past. Wills was able to juxtapose a forceful sense of historical authenticity against an atmosphere of modernity. The Wills firm, which by the mid-1930s included Merton S. Barrows, Robert E. Minot, both MIT trained architects, and later Warren J. Roeder and Royal Son Richard, both educated at the Boston Architectural Center, now Boston Architectural College, would go on to design more than 2,500 houses there were commissions across the United States, as well as Australia, Canada, and the British West Indies. In states from Florida to Washington, Texas to Minnesota, clients enthusiastically responded to the firm's well-designed homes. I want to share one example with you, this charming house that Thomas O. Mattingly commissioned in Newport Beach, California, which Wills designed about 1936. Mattingly wanted a traditional New England home only one block from the Pacific Ocean. Here is the, an exterior view. Uh, here is the original elevation that Wills did of the house. It's a very simple, uh, very uh, scaled down structure. And here you can see one block from the Pacific Ocean interiors of the Mattingly House at the time. Um, the house um, in, in several years ago, we, when we were cataloging the collection, we, re we learned that this house uh, in Newport Beach is in pristine condition. It is surrounded by huge houses, more recent houses, and it sits on the block. Uh, um, it, it's a little bit like Virginia Lee Burton's uh, uh, book about the house. Um, and it was for sale for $4 million. Uh, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of Wills's um, influence and Wills's uh, recognition across the country. 
In addition to custom designed homes, Wills also sold standard plans in a wide variety of styles, including traditional garrison colonial and Cape Cod houses, as well as modern designs and ranch houses. So hundreds and hundreds of these sets of plans were purchased, were sold throughout the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. And even uh, in uh, perhaps most surprising, a customer at an American Samoa purchased a contemporary style home that the firm originally designed for a house on Cape Cod. The late architectural historian and Tufts University professor, Margaret Henderson Floyd wrote this about Wills, quote, the small house of Royal Barry Wills initiated one of the most successful regional forms of architecture in the 20th century. While most of his colleagues served corporate civic, corporate, civic and wealthy private clients, Wills was the first architect to aim at upgrading the small house market. Given the influence of Wills's firm on American architecture and its Boston base, it made sense for historic New England to work with Richard Wills, royal son, to uh, acquire the firm's archives. Richard, who along with uh, Barrows and Minot and Roeder had continued the firm after Wills's death at 67 in 1962. In 2013, Richard donated the archives to historic New England. Boxes filled with architectural drawings, photographs, manuscripts, scrapbooks, client files, ephemera, audio files arrived at our Haverhill facility. In order to make this extraordinary collection accessible to the public, we secured $150,000 in matching funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and additional support from the Felicia Fund, Robert and Elizabeth Owens, and Kristen and Roger Servison. So here we are with hundreds and uh, with huge numbers of boxes, and we had we needed to catalog and digitize it. We um, there are approximately thirty one thousand five hundred individual drawings in the collection. This is an early uh, an early drawing. It's a collection number. It's it's commission number five hundred. Typically, architects start numbering their commissions with the number 100 because they know that no client wants to be number one. So um, this, is, this is commission number 500. It's for a charming Cape Cod house in, um, in, in Lincoln, Massachusetts. You can see the massive chimney. You can see the, um, the, the low pitch of the roof. It's a very typical Will's design. So, um, I'm also going to show you uh, several renderings that Royal Barry Wills did, uh, which have become part of the collection. This is a house in Melrose, Mass. And Wills typically, uh, this is a house, another house in Lincoln, Mass, charming uh, design for a um, cape. And um, Wills typically presented his clients with these colorful renderings. And we know this because several clients or several um, homeowners, current homeowners have donated their renderings by wills to us. And we have also found a number of them on eBay and we have purchased them. So, and here's a house, uh, another wonderful cape in Arlington. Um, so, it, you know, we, I have no idea how long it took wills to do these drawings. They are, just very freehand, but they have such a, they convey such a sense of, 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 of the, the building. Um, in addition to the, uh, uh, so there, as I said, there were 31,500 drawings and we digitized about 7,300 7, of them. We couldn't, we could not afford to digitize all 31,000. 31, 
we also um, digitized, uh, we cataloged and digitized 3,100 photographs that not only illustrate the firm's uh, examples of the firm's work, and I'm showing you uh, just a few here, but, and, but also both professional and candid photographs of the firm. And there are some members uh, out on the ocean, looks like they're having a nice time. And Wills certainly understood the importance of photography in promoting his work. He hired uh, most of, or many of his photographs he commissioned from Arthur Cushman Haskell, who was a prominent architectural photographer in Boston. And um, Haskell was actually uh, also photographed um, the Historic American Building Survey, and uh, and um, it was was a very was connected to Historic New England through William Sumner Appleton, the founder, and also through Abbott Lowell Cummings, um, a, 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 for, a later director of the society. When when uh, Haskell died. In uh, 1968, his negatives came to historic New England. So it's a, an, another nice connection to the Wills firm. And I should say also that Royal Barry Wills was a member of the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, the, the previous name of historic New England. I mentioned the scrapbooks to you. We completely digitized 18 unique scrapbooks, which were kept by the firm from 1927 to 1972. And these scrapbooks provide remarkable documentation of the firm's work from its earliest days and showcase Wills' extraordinary ability to promote himself and his firm through the press. They're just an, an amazing resource and um, I don't think we could ever reconstruct all of these articles because some of the papers from which he, they're taken are defined. We just, they're just an extraordinary resource. As I mentioned before, Wills wrote or co-authored eight books about architecture of which I've also said hundreds of thousands were sold. And so we were, we, a part of the collection that came to us were the manuscripts for these books and the original drawings for his cartoons. And so this is houses have funny bones. Um, I show you a manuscript sheet and a, a, a cartoon of a, a prospective client with a bird landing on her, on her hat. Um, <clears throat> and so we were able to um, uh, catalog and digitize um, some of some of these uh, manuscripts and and cartoons. And as I said, if Wills had not been an architect, he would have been a cartoonist. Living on the uh, here's a, here's a self portrait of Wills. So living on the level was another book uh, that Wills did. It was living on the level houses on one story, and it was illustrated not by Wills, but with extraordinarily beautiful architectural renderings. By Charles, uh, by by Charles Crombie, and these we have the original drawings, and as you can see, once again, it's about a, a multiple styles. This this extraordinary cape, the um, these this modern house, and Crombie was an extraordinary delineator and just did beautiful work. So we're very fortunate to have the um, originals of these of the living on the level drawings. So um, Wills, in addition to working with the newspapers, he worked with Ladies Home Journal and Ladies Home Journal would uh, pr produce these packets, which you could buy for a dollar. And the packet would have floor plans for Cape Cod style houses. And it would have little cardboard um, models that you could put together so you could get a sense of what the house was going to, the scale of the house, the massing of the house. And so we have a number of these that, that Wills worked with Ladies Home Journal uh, on in the 1930s. Here's another one that he did with uh, the Boston Varnish Company. And you could just, um, you could buy these. And then of course you would have to hire an architect 
uh, once you just actually decided to build them. Um, we also cataloged uh, Wills's original speeches of which we said he gave many and, uh, and also his awards. And we even, and here are some of the, the speeches, um, we even restored and reformatted recordings of some of his radio interviews and lectures. In all, we digitized approximately 13,000 items. We are now, uh, the, all of the images are available on our website. And um, the Wills, members of uh, Royal Son, Charlie Wills, came to the uh, archives at some point not too long ago. And we let him, he asked if he could hear the recordings that we had digitized. And the family, his wife and his daughters were just, just amazed to hear Wills's voice uh, through these recordings. Um, so we also, one of the things that we knew right from the beginning was that Wills had uh, a, a great number of architects working with him over the years. And it was really important for us to, um, capture the names of these architects uh, because many of them went on to uh, other works such as Hugh Stubbins. And so we have tracked all of the architects. Uh, if we haven't figured that out there, if they've just signed their initials and we haven't figured that out, we are still working on that. Um, so here is a, a Hugh St another Hugh Stubbins drawing. You can see his signature in the bottom right. And surprisingly, this is one time when he did a he did a, a a Cape Cod style house and not a modern style house. So um, here is my former colleague Lynn Pashtag standing in front of thirty seven some of the thirty seven flat files that we were able to acquire with the grant and all of the document boxes um, in, in, uh, in containing the the documents for the Wills collection. And these are all stored in our Haverhill facility. Um, <clears throat> the collection is uh, online, as I said. <clears throat> and here is the um, first page of the finding aid. It's a 115 page finding aid to the Royal Barry Wills collection. And so we are, um, we are thrilled that that's available to the public. Sadly, Richard Wills died in 2014 before he could see the results of his, the, the, re, the results of the cataloging. And, uh, and uh, but I'm sure he would be very pleased with what we have done. Uh, Richard's daughter, Jessica Wills Lipscomb uh, took over the firm in 2014 when her father died but decided to close it in 2017. And at that point, she donated the rest of the firm's archives to us. So we still have those to catalog. Um, here is uh, the family in Haverhill. Um, Richard Wills's son, Charlie, is the second on, from the uh, right, from my right and his wife uh, and his daughters and their husband. So it was a very moving day when they were able to come. And, and Charlie has been a great source of information to us over, over the course of the project. Um, we hope that the broad collection of, that the broad access to this collection will be of value to those who own Royal Barry Wills homes to the cities and towns with Royal Barry Wills neighborhoods and developments, to architectural historians, to, to actually anyone interested in the, in the history of American architecture. Um, we do receive many requests of, about the collection from homeowners, um, from architectural historians. It has been, um, once it was cataloged, it was written um, up in uh, Architectural Digest. It's been on um, a number of, of, of television programs, the PBS shows about uh, homes. Um, so it, it is getting the kind of uh, use that we had hoped for. And I think that use will only continue. Um, so I really wanted to spend the last few minutes talking with you about 
the houses that Will's designed in your area. And um, I'm very grateful to uh, Chris Gustafson for emailing me photographs of many of them. Those will now be added to our files, Chris. Thank you so much. This is a um, certainly not a Cape Cod style house. This is a house that he, de he designed, that Will's designed for Paul Smith in Worcester, Massachusetts. It still stands today. And we received, uh, uh, we have been in touch with the current homeowner who sent us photographs and was absolutely delighted and thrilled to learn that we have a complete set of plans for this house. This is the William Sawyer house in Holden. And again, I just went through our collection and pulled images that were from your area. And just to give you a sense of the variety and, and, and to show that Wills really was very active in, in the Shrewsbury area. Um, this is, um, this is, this house is in, um, let's see, oh my goodness, I forget where this house is, but it's a wonderful garrison style house that, that's somewhere near Shrewsbury. Um, and, uh, the, oh, I see, it's, it's right up at the top. It's the J. Randolph Quick House, and this is the Donald Johnson House in Upton. The J. Randolph Quick House, here's the floor plan. And these are all pieces of paper, they're on trace. And when uh, Richard Wills first turned over the collection to us, he said to us, I really don't think there will be much that's early left. I think things have been thrown away over the years, we've had floods, but when we started to unpack the collection, we, re we found very, very early commissions like that house in Lincoln that I showed you we also found commission number 100, which I assume is a, is a very early one. This is the William Murray house in, in Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, he did this without doing the coloring, uh, but he, again, you always see the, the giant RBW in the, in the right-hand corner. Uh, again, another drawing of the, of the Murray house in, in Milford. The James Tynan house in Southbridge very traditional, um, in, and here are some interior elevations. Uh, the Cameron Geiler House in Westboro, Mass, uh, a traditional, a very traditional cape. And um, it's always, as we started to catalog this collection, it became very clear to us that there were things that he put into every, he loved cupolas on the garage. He loved to have wonderful lanterns to the left or right of the front doors. He loved to have the picket fence in front of the house. Um, so there were things that, and of course the chimney, the, 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 the chimney I think is a dead giveaway for, for, for Will's house. This is the a relative's house in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Alexander Will's house. And another, this is, that was the rendering and here is the, the architectural elevation. Uh, the B Butler house in Worcester. And I asked Chris today if this was a relative, the Mr. and Mrs. O. Vincent Gustafson house in Worcester and she said it was not. Um, but another, again, another nice rendering for, for a project. And then Chris sent me photographs of the houses um, in, in your neighborhood. And I am thrilled to add these to the PowerPoint and, um, and, and show these to you as well. Um, this, this is the sad story of the JM Martin house, which Chris let me know is no longer there. And of course, this is something that we are all grappling with in terms of the Wills houses are not big. They are, they tend to be um, one and a half stories. They tend to be, uh, they don't, they're, they're not massive. And so they don't always uh, appeal to people who like to buy giant sofas and huge pieces of furniture because they won't fit in them. So we are grappling with the loss of these houses in some cases. Um, 30 Hillcrest Avenue. 
um, <clears throat> Cherry Street. I'm, th I'm thrilled to have these, Chris. Thank you. Prospect Street. And the first Royal Barry Wills House in Shrewsbury. Um, I'm going to just go back to that, but uh, it's it's interesting because Royal Barry Wills was the most popular architect in America, but yet there is so little serious material written about him because he was in effect um, swimming against the top. Modernism. And the academics were writing about modernism, and they were not looking at the traditional house in the form that Royal Barry Wills was working. And so we really hope that um, with this archive at Historic New England, that, that this will change and that there will be uh, more accurate histories of American domestic architecture that will be written. So um, I am very happy to answer any questions. And thank again, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Wanna thank you. The wonderful presentation. I love seeing the old houses, especially the ones from Shrewsbury. I, I recognize this one. This one looks like Prospect Street. But thank you very much. Uh, our June twenty second program. Finding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero by author Christian Despigna. That'll be next month's program. Well, thank you very much, Lorna. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. And if anyone has any questions or wants to get in touch with me, I'm just happy to uh, just send me an email at Historic New England. And um I will stop sharing my screen and uh, and good luck with everything in Shrewsbury. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.